What's the deal, people? It's your boy Big Star Raw Sports here, man. Um, make sure you log on to the website, rawsports.tv, and check it out once these interviews are done for the night. Um, make sure you log on to the YouTube channel, Raw Sports Films. Um, appreciate y'all tuning in, man, for the grand finale of uh, season two, week two of Legends Week. Uh, it's going to be a classic, man. Um, if any, you know, any of you guys have been paying attention to the Legends Week series, um, I ended uh, week one uh, on a high note uh, with Billy Owens, the legend Billy Owens, man. So it's only right that I end the season two, week two of Legends Week on another high note with another super legend, Ronald Flip Murray. Um, any younger ballers out there, if you don't know the name, um, you're definitely going to leave tonight with a lot of history, you know what I'm saying? This is definitely gonna be a name that you'll never, you'll never forget. Um, and for all the, you know, individuals, you know, hoop fans, hoop junkies, especially here in PA, uh, that were around when Flip was doing his thing at Strawberry Mansion and beyond, you know, you're definitely in for a treat as he goes through and um, just, you know, relives the memories, man, and, and, you know, just talks about his life. So uh, we're gonna get the legend on here, man, and, um, you know, it's gonna be a, a legendary night. Season two of Legends Week here, my man Ronald Flip Murray in a second. Just waiting for the request from the big homie. There we go. The legend. Star, what's up? I'm always blessed, man. How you? How how are you, man? I'm chilling, bro. I'm out the way. I'm chilling. No doubt. That that beard is looking nice, man. I'm trying to get it right, man. I mean, I'm struggling. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> As we all are. You know, just making the best of it. <laughs> I, I was actually tempted to get the Clippers and either try to line myself up around the neck or let wifey do it. I said, I just I just leave it alone. Man, you just got to let it be right now, man. Let it be. I know that's right, man. Well, hey, um, thank you for joining me, man. This is the season finale of, um, you know, each week. I call it a season. So this is week two. So this is season two of uh, Legends Week. Um, ended on a high note, man, you know, got you on tonight. So I just want to thank you for joining me, man. Um, you know, Legends Week, man, it's just my opportunity, my way to, to, to pay homage um, to individuals like yourself, man, that I consider legends, guys that gave so much to Pennsylvania and beyond. I mean, you played your heart out for years. Um, so many classic memories, so many classic games. So I just want to do two things. Um, I just want to, you know, my goal is to accomplish two things, is to not let the guys that were around back then watching you forget. I just don't want anyone to ever forget about your legacy and the thing that you've done. And also this generation, um, I just want to educate them on players like yourself. I don't want them to be in a gym next to you and not know who you are. I want them, I want them to pay homage, be able to shake your hand, say, hey, Mr. Flip, you know, thank you. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get to where to where to where you've been, man. So I just want to bring everybody together and um just pay homage to the legends, man. So here we are, man. Legends Week two with Flip Murray, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, man. So I'm to be on. I already know, man. So we're gonna get right into it. We're gonna have some fun. We're gonna have some laughs uh, before we get into the serious uh, stuff and you know let you tell your story. Um, a little segment I call um ten random questions. I'm just ask you just ten random things off the top of my head. All right. All right. All right. Um, favorite cartoon growing up. <clears throat> My favorite cartoon going up, yes, uh, probably was Thundercats. Thundercats, yes, classic, definitely a classic. Um, what was your favorite NBA player growing up? Like when you was hooping out there playing crate ball, and you would, you know, was it what, what name was you shouting out back then? Clyde Drexler is my favorite player. That's the reason I wear twenty two. So Clyde Drexler is my favorite player growing up. Got you. Um, how did you get the nickname Flip? Where and when did that come from? Flip came from one of my friends, my close friends, uh, Corey. Corey Cornbread Dickerson. Oh, Brad, uh, I know Brad. Yeah, you already know. <laughs> so, uh, we went to um, go watch the movie Above the Room when we was young boys. We all went to go watch the movie or whatever. You know how when you're young boys, everybody clown and bust on each other. Bitch, and yeah, give exactly. Each other bed, give each other names. So Birdie Mac played Flip in the, uh, in the Butter Room. And he used to tell me after, the, after we watched the movie, he used to come out and say, you, know, you look like Birdie Mac, you look like Flip in the, in the Butter Room. And they used to call me Flip. From the beginning, I used to hate it. I used yeah. to hate it when it started that. And then after a while, you know, everybody, that's how we got, got our nickname. We just stuck with us. That's how we gave him uh, the nickname Cornbread, all the movie Cornbread Earl and Mink. Exactly. Like, oh, I'm that's telling you, I mean, you know, when we was young boys, we used to bid on each other. We started giving each other nicknames as jokes. And then, I mean, as as time went on, it just it just stuck with us. So, and then it was. That was our nicknames. No doubt. You know, nicknames is a part of growing up. 
Right. They, 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 they're within your crew, and then they they kind of trickle out. They, they kind of trickle beyond your crew, and other people other people catch on. Then before you know it, everybody calling you that. Right. <laughs> and that's exactly how it went. That's exactly how it went. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt. Um, what what are the most points you ever scored in a game at any level? High school, college, pro, anything? Uh, well, organized ball or uh, it don't matter. Summer leagues, leagues, 61. anything. Yeah, sixty one. Sixty one. Where, where and when yeah. was that? This was in a uh, um, in the Merrill game, and, and when I was in high school at Strawberry Mansion. Gotcha. And sixty-one <laughs> that game. Professionally wise, uh, the league was thirty-one. College was uh was forty. Forty. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, have you ever made? I mean, you got you know you know for your nasty handle and all that. Have you ever made uh you know some people fall and like hit the canvas off the crossover or something? Definitely. That's how you got. That's how you got the. Uh, the recognition of having a handle coming up in Philly, you had to make a couple of fall, run out of balance or something. So, <laughs> what's, you know, what's, what's one that sticks out in your mind that happened that, that people probably still talk about today in barbershops? Uh, ah, that's tough. You know, if you I, can remember one, I don't know. I mean, because a lot of them just came from our regular pickup ball, just playing regular pickup ball. So uh, I'm trying to see the most. I don't know. I can't even think about the most. The craziest one, for real, for real. Uh, the one that everybody keep coming up to me and say is uh, uh, when I crossed the Brian in the um, rookie sophomore game. We played them in a rookie sophomore game, so a lot of people <laughs> always bring that up, saying I mean I mean I'm touch the ground. So I mean that's about the classic to have on a legend. So let me put that one out there. I forgot about that. I got to look that up afterwards. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, um, during your era in high school, um, mm -hmm. who were who who was one of your favorite players, like besides yourself, like in the in the, you know the '90s, early 2000s? Uh, Lynn Gray was always one of the toughest players I thought was in my class. As far as uh, us coming up in high school in '97, I always thought Lynn Gray game was always polished, even at the high school level. It seemed like his game was way more mature than what ours was. He was way more poised at that age, playing in the high school basketball level, and he had like a a high IQ of the game. So Lynn Gray was definitely one. Uh, Jared Kears was definitely another another one that I thought was was like he was above what how old he was. His game was he was like already a pro at high school for for his game was already at pro level. I'm being six five playing a point guard. Those are two game names that really stuck out. And that was my year. Prior to my year, I'm gonna have to decide probably say uh, Arthur Yah Davis. Yah Davis was a was a super tough guard. He was he was hard to guard, man. He was six five. He had a grown man body in high school, man, and he was super talented and, and, and highly skilled. So those are probably the three names that really stick out to me when I when I talk about coming up in my era. Got you. I'm just curious. Can you cook? Are you a chef in the kitchen or on the grill? Not a uh, not a bone certified chef, but you know what I mean. My you, wife, you my, the, wife, my wife, my wife is the cooker. She's the cooker. But I be trying to steal a couple recipes and couple. Couple things from her while she be here doing her thing. So, well, well, just I'm curious, really just just curious. If it's Valentine's Day, you know, whatever the case is, you want to impress wifey. You know, you know she coming home in a couple hours. You got to whip something up. What you going? What you going to put together to impress wifey? I'm probably go with a black and salmon, uh, some roasted potatoes, and I got to get a vegetable in there, a green, probably asparagus. I know she likes asparagus. I probably have to go with asparagus. No doubt, no doubt. What's up? What, what's one of your favorite sports movies of all time? If you had to pick one. One that you could just watch over and over and over. Butter Rum. That was that movie. We were going to say it, Butter Rum. I mean, that was a classic movie for us when we came out, uh, you know, playing a, the, uh, growing up playing a, the outdoor basketball, you know, in the, in the league, in the city leagues. Uh, and that whole atmosphere of the Butter Rum, that tournament style, you know, that's something that we could adapt to, something that we was used to coming up as young. Uh, above. No doubt. What, um, Besides yourself um, being, a, being a nasty ball handler, who was somebody else that you respected um, ball handler-wise, like in the city of Philly, like in the 90s or, you know, just before your air or anything? A.O. and Rashid Bey. It's hard to hear you a little bit. I'm, I'm going to I said A.O. and Rashid Bey. A.O. and Rashid Bey? Yes. You know, I, Rashid Bey had a, a crazy handle. So did A.O. I actually played against both of them coming up when I was a young guy. So watching Shee Bey. Shee Bey really had, had the ball on the yo-yo. He had that on string. Coming yeah, up, yeah. watch him play. So, um, from Philly, my era, I definitely got to say Shebae and AL for sure. 
Got, got, you, got you. What, one last question of the 10, uh, 10 random questions. Um, during your NBA um, career, um, what's one of your most memorable highlights like that you had, like something that was kind of like, you know, ESPN top 10 worthy, um, you know, from something that you'll, you'll, that you'll never forget? Uh, my second year in the league, I had a chance. To, uh, everybody know I had a chance to start, uh, like, the first 20 games when uh, I was back in that Ray Allen. Um, he had got injured at the beginning of the year, and I had a chance to start the first 20 games. We had a game we played against Minnesota. It was, like, the first, uh, the second or third game that we played. We played the first two over in Japan against the Clippers, but the regular season we came back, and we played against Minnesota and Minnesota, and I had the, uh, a game winner that, that, that beat, beat them and, and in Minnesota. It was a – Intense game too. They crowd and everything, and then I had a chance to hit a tough shot on one of the greatest, one of the greatest defenders that ever played in the NBA on Charles Sprewell. So I think that's one of my most uh, memorable uh, games in the NBA. Yeah, that's dope, man. That's dope, man. Yeah. All right, well, hey, just want to get into it, man. Um, you know, my my, my style of, of interviewing the legends, man. You know, I don't want to get in your way. I don't want to, um, you know pigeonhole you and to answer my questions. Obviously, I have some questions prepared, but I just want to, you know, respect you and just give you the freedom just to kind of tell your story. Then I'll kind of interject, you know, as we go along. So um, just just start just start off, man, just by telling us the the, the, the Ronald Flip Murray story just from from the beginning, man. Where, where did your story begin? And um, just just reintroduce yourself and just tell us, you know, where, where the story began for, for you, man. Um, you know, me growing up in North Philly, um, I grew up in um, – Cross town, my younger years, my elementary school days, I went to um, Hartranf. I used to stay off the 8th and Kamala, and I grew up over there um, playing basketball. I started playing – I actually played football first. I was playing football in my younger years. I used to play with the uh, West Oak Green Wildcats coming up, playing recreation football. So I really started getting into basketball probably around like 10, I want to say 9, 10 years old. That's when I really, really started playing, like getting into basketball. And I was always playing in like um, – uh, older class of mine. Like when I was ten years old, I started out playing in, in with the twelve and unders. Gotcha. So um, at the time, the commissioner who was cuz they were hard tramps. Uh, he didn't know. He he thought that I was like twelve, thirteen years old at the time. And I was only ten playing. So gotcha. I actually had a chance to. Uh, <laughs> I actually had a chance to go down the age and go play with my regular age, which was ten and under. And we ended up winning the championship down there. My first time we playing any type of recreation or any type of organized basketball. Um. Then as time went on, 10, 12 years old, I started getting involved with the uh, Police Athletic League. We played um, a travel team. That's the first time we started traveling to play basketball. First time I went out of state to play basketball, we went to uh, West Palm Beach to play in the tournament, the power tournament, and we ended up winning that. We actually won the power tournament by three years in a row, traveling, playing three years in a row. So uh, after that, uh, you know, high school, well, middle school, Played on the middle school squad as well, so I went to Roosevelt. Played a basketball team there with Roosevelt. Um, had a couple guys that was nice on my team as well there. Um, went to Germantown my freshman year. Didn't play basketball my freshman year. Oh, uh, wow. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I went to Germantown my freshman year. So uh, after playing down 33rd Street with my grandmother from my father's side, they was all from down that way, Strawberry Mansion area. Went down there and played in a basketball tournament down there. Was playing, was hooping out there. And, um, you know, sad when, you know, him and my brother was, like, close. Him and my brother was, like, super close. They seen me play. They asked me to play in that league down there with them. So that's how I got introduced to the North Philly Strong Mansion area or playing with them. Um, man, Mark Andy Sterling, who was, like, assistant coach for Strawberry Mansion at the time, asked me to transfer. He wanted me to transfer to come to Strawberry Mansion. That's how I got the mansion. Um, ended up transferring mansion in the beginning of my sophomore year, my 10th grade year. And, um, went over to Mansion and started playing there at Mansion. Uh, 10th grade year, it was coming off the bench. We had all seniors that were starting. So, you know, we had to wait our turn. And, man, still got some playing time. But, you know, um, you, you know you have to wait your turn when you're playing behind a bunch of seniors, especially being a sophomore, even though I knew I was, was capable of even being starting at that time. But, you know, that's just how the game go. Um, who, who, just hey, out of curiosity, who were some of the seniors and the upperclassmen that she was, you know, playing behind when you were younger? Uh, Kareem Johnson, uh, Prentice Miller, this was our center. Um, uh, who was the two guard at our time right there? Bud was the two guard at the time. So those were the seniors that was that was starting five for us. And um, we had a young class that was playing. We had a lot of, like, sophomores and freshmen that was on that team at the time that was getting a lot of playing time under them. So we had a chance to uh, play, play under them, get – 
get the feel of the, the public league and what it was going to be like when we had our chance. So when we came, my my junior and senior year was like a walk in the park for it. Then because then we was able to go out and then make our own name and get our own buzz that was going on, especially with the backcourt meet that I had with Kevin Buzz for me. Um, we was able to, you know I mean, start our own our our own little legacy there, mansion with us in that backcourt. So, um, I mean, it was a fun time playing high school basketball there, mansion. Um, had a lot of great games. I felt as though we should have won it one year, but we always. Hey, it's hard, it's, 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 it's hard to hear you. Can you can hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you clear now. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was always a matchup against us and Gratz, my, 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 my junior and senior year. So, we always had problems with them, man, but they always had a uh, – <laughs> I felt as though they always had the best team in the city for real, for real. And they also had one of the – if not the best coach uh, in the public league ever. So, um, it was always a tough matchup with them. But, I mean, against them. But it was it was a good time just to play against them. It was fun to play against them. It was a great experience. I learned a lot from it playing in the, um, in the public league, playing against them as well. Um, after uh, after high school, I attended junior college. I went to uh, Meridian Community College in Mississippi. Um, I played there for two years. Um, actually, we made the final four. Few uh, technical difficulties. That's you know, that's that's the that's the Instagram way. Hopefully, uh, this don't bother us too much before we uh you know get this classic interview done. We're gonna get my man Flip Murray back on. <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get it back. We're gonna get it back on people. Yeah, you we, we you back? You, can you hear me? Yeah, apologize. You know, they cut me off. I don't know how I happened to cut me off though. Yeah, it's cool. If that happens, you know, we'll just keep going out and going back in. We're going to get it done. Okay. Yeah, yeah so I, I attended junior college in Mississippi, played two years there, man, and uh, came back home after that my uh, sophomore year. And, you know, I helped around the house. My mom was working, got a job here. I sat out a year. I didn't want to play basketball at community college because I didn't want to waste one of my years as far as eligibility playing uh, college basketball. Plus, I just played in junior college. So I um, went to community college for a year. Um had to work on my grades to get my grades right. End up meeting a coach. So, 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 so after Meridian, then you went to a community to, to community college. I went to community college in Philly. I came oh, home. Oh, CCP, got you. Yeah, I was home. I came home. I got a job. I was working at a little telemarket spot out of Springfield. So I had I had a chance to make me a couple of dollars, put some money in my pocket, stay home for a minute, and try to um, maneuver and think about what my next move was going to be. Had a chance to um, <clears throat> meet with the head coach at the time at Shaw it was Joe Hopkins. Um, Came down actually to see Jerry Karras and I at the same time to try to get us both to come to Shaw. We both committed to Shaw. Um, went to Shaw University, man. Played in the CIAA. A great, a great basketball atmosphere. A great basketball tournament. Um, a lot of history behind the CIAA and you know the HBCUs that I didn't know about prior to getting to Shaw. So I had a chance to uh, you know really embrace all that. I had a um, successfully two years at um, at Shaw. Uh, senior year was starting to get a little recognition. I had a lot of people coming out scouts as far as NBA wise coming to check me out and watch the games and, and you know, starting to get a little buzz, getting the name out there. I had a chance to get invited to a couple camps after my, my senior year at Shaw. So um went to a couple NBA workouts, went to uh, Portsmouth, I went to the Chicago pre draft camp. Um I had a terrible Portsmouth. I didn't do too good in Portsmouth at all. I had a when you, when you when you say terrible, what do you mean by terrible? Terrible, I didn't feel like I didn't I didn't give um how can I say I didn't give a a good viewing of myself and my talents of what I really can do because I really was put in a in a in a, a bad situation where I was coming off the bench for one. I really wasn't playing that much. The coach didn't give me that much time. It was a guard that played on my team. He went to Rice at the time. I can't remember the kid's name though, man. He played at Rice. He was a guard. But 
<clears throat> whoever he was, the coach had some type of favoritism towards him because he kept on – everything yeah. was ran through him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the ball, everything, he was the point guard, everything was ran through him, and I didn't really play that much. Uh, but when I went to Chicago, pre-draft camp, I was able to really showcase my talents, and I was put on a bigger screen where it was – I mean, the biggest showcase when it was more um, NBA scouts. Everybody was there to watch me. And I had a, I had a very, 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 very good camp. A very good camp when I went there. So, um, got invited to like seventeen pre-draft workouts before the draft. I had to work out for seventeen different teams within like a two and a half, three weeks period. Um, had a lot of good workouts. Played against all the top guards at the time that was projected to be top. You know, like, give, give me, give me, give me some names. Uh, Jason Williams, Wine Dixon, Dan Dicka, um, Vincent Yarborough, Matt Barnes, um, I'm trying to see who else the tough guards that was there. Um, Steve Logan, Frank Williams, these was all the guys that were playing at Division One level, and it was expected to be, um, you know, um, lottery picks and stuff like that. So I went out to Santa Monica at the time. I had um, Aaron Tellum as my agent. He was one of the big time agents. Uh, in the game at the time, and he was stationed out in Santa Monica. So I went out there to work out with them and had a chance to play against them guys every day and uh, really get a feel about, I mean, who they were, what type of players they were, stuff like that. So that that helped me prepare me for the um, for all the pre-draft workouts when I had to go up head-to-head against them. So um, all my workouts, was I say, was pretty fair. It was pretty nice. Uh, I really think I, I left the um, impression on all the people, I mean, all the teams that I did go work out for. Um End up getting drafted, uh, second round, forty second pick with Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Um, it was a it was a wonderful feeling at the time, man. I had you know the family, everybody, my friends, everybody was over. I had the Channel Six News at my house on <laughs> draft day, so we had a chance to you know experience all that with my friends and my family, man. And then just to hear my name get called, wow. Um, you know what I'm saying? Get my name called, saying I was drafted, and. Uh, was heading to Milwaukee to play in the NBA, man. It was like, I mean, wow. I mean, it was an unbelievable experience at the time, man. Um, so once I got drafted, I had to go play summer league. I played summer league with the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, we played in Atlanta and we played in, um, was it Boston? No, I'm sorry, Atlanta and Orlando. Was that the regular NBA summer league? Yeah, it was the NBA summer league. Yeah, so once the draft, you know, once the draft was over, I left uh, here like a week. I left like two, three days after the draft, like a week time. We had to go practice. Just, just curious, one of the younger players, my man Naeem McLeod um, from PW. Now he's at Florida, um, uh, Florida State Seminoles. He wasn't a, a, what, what, around what year is this? Just so the younger people can put it in perspective. This was 02. I got drafted in 2002. Gotcha, gotcha. But this was 02. Um, had a chance to go play in the summer league. Um, I actually did my thing in the summer league, man. We had. We actually had five rookies that got drafted at the time. We ended up going undefeated in the in the, in the uh, summer league. Um, I mean, at the time, they didn't have like a championship uh, playoffs or anything the like whole that. Whole thing, you just yeah, played they, had, they didn't have that. We just played. I mean, who they put in front of us, and it was that. So we didn't really declare who was the winner or nothing like that. But I think we went end up winning like I think we went six and one, if I'm not mistaken. I think we went six and one. But I did have a great a, a great summer league. I was averaging about like 27, 28 points in my summer wow. league. So <laughs> immediately after uh, summer league, they signed me because you know mm-hmm. second round, those contracts are guaranteed. I'm second round. Exactly. Like so, so, so you were still pretty much in a job interview. Yes. The whole time. Yes, I was still wow. working out to try to make the team. I was still trying out to make the team. So that was my uh, you know my welcoming party the the summer league to really like um, try to get the coaches and the, and the organization to really uh, believe in me and assign me. So after the summer league, um, I think they liked what they saw and they signed me to a two-year deal. So that that's what started my NBA career. Mm-hmm. All right, well, well let, let's pause right there real quick. And I just want to go back a little bit. Um, when did you first fall in love with basketball, like, like fall in love with it? And then when did you realize that you were kind of pretty good and starting to be a little bit better than your peers like just go you know, back back in the day i fell in love with the game I, I mean when i was like probably like eight nine like i tell people that's all the time when i used to watch basketball like i always been like a, a student of the game i always like to analyze the game like i knew about defensive rotations of the nba game when i was 19 years old just watching wow. the game 
Wow. And, and just watching to see how how they trap off the double team off the post and how they was rotating out of the defense and, and you know, the weak side would come over and close out on the opposite side on the strong side. I was I was that type of type of player where though that when I when I seen that, like it automatically stuck with me. Like I understood the the, the basketball, I mean the NBA game at that time. I used to always watch um my step pop had a um uh, a, a basketball tape in his in his, in his, um, in his closet. I used to always go watch it. The superstars, it was called yes. superstars. Yeah, so had uh, all the highlights. Of with all the highlights, yeah. right? Clyde Jackson, George, Jordan, Jordan Barclay, with, with Clyde, the '80s Bird, music and everything. All of everybody had their own music. It, Green, I remember that tape. Magic. That was a popular tape. Right. A, everybody had right. that tape right there. Yeah. I used to always watch that. I, I, I know every song, every player that was on there. <laughs> I used to watch that all the time. So that's when I think I really fell in love with the game. That's what made me start playing the game. And as far as me really knowing, I never thought about, you know, people used to always say to me all the time, like, um, are you thinking about going to the league or playing the league? I never really thought about it at the time because of my situation that I was in from one of the junior college. I really never thought about going to the league at, at the junior college. I really didn't start believing it until after I met my coach, uh, Shaw. And he and he actually sat down and, and he talked to me before I even went to Shaw. He signed with him. He told me the first time he seen me, he seen me play. He told me straight up. He said, "You're a pro." He said, "You're a pro." Just by me watching you just now from his workout, you're definitely a pro. If you listen to everything I say you to do, come to school with the right mindset. I guarantee you that I'm going to get you to the NBA. Wow. So you know, once he told me that, you know, it was it was a no brainer for me. You know, hey, I, just I curious, just, just 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 curious. I sorry to cut you off, but I'm just curious. I mean, that was a powerful moment for me just hearing that. That yeah. was almost like that reminds me of like a father who instills something in his son or tells yeah. his son about some potential that he has that the son doesn't even know he has. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, that does something for the son, and and all of a sudden that just can change a kid's whole mindset and perspective. You know what I'm saying? So explain to me in that moment, man, what that did for you as far as like building your confidence or you know what that moment was like for you that he that he saw that in you and said that to you. And then how and then how were you different after that? It definitely installed a a, a different confidence level. Um for him to come out to say something like that, first time him ever meeting me and him to be uh that genuine and really believe um and me as a player, as far as me being a pro, I mean, that really stuck with me, man. I really trusted in what he said and, and what he was telling me, and I believed in him, and he also believed in me as well, as far as me being a pro and be, me be able to take my game to another level and play at a higher level of basketball. So, you know, that gave me the ultimate confidence. He really put and installed everything, his beliefs into me. He um, let me really do my thing at Shaw University for real, for real. He put the ball in my hand, so he ran everything through me for real, for real. So that let me know. Uh, from the jump that he was really serious about what he was saying and he really believed in me and, and, and as a basketball player and he wanted to see me excel and try to take my talent to another level. So um, it definitely put a chip on my shoulder along with the Shaw. Um, like I said, my first year, we, we, we did all right my first year. We ended up losing in the tournament and in, uh, in the quarters. But um, my senior year, though, I had all-time all time confidence coming back into my senior year that I got a chance to, you know, really experience what the CIAA was about and, you know, the, the the atmosphere, the speed of the game and everything. So I really knew what to expect coming into my senior year, and I knew what I had to do as far as to get over the hump as far as it's going to win a championship. Yeah. Hey, just d describe to the younger <clears throat> players that, that, that never saw you play or just remember you from the NBA days or whatever, um, describe your game, like, like during the, you know, during the summer leagues and high school, like what, what – what were some of your strengths back then? And, you know, just describe the style of player you were, you know, throughout your career and especially when you were younger. Always been a, always been a slasher and a scorer, always. Uh, I think my gift that I had was basketball. I was always able to score the basketball no matter what level I was at. Uh, scoring the basketball came easy to me, uh, I guess, as a young fella um, because I was always able to go out and, and be able to create my own shot. I was always able to get my own shot off. I didn't really need no pick and roll and nothing like that. It was more of a one-on-one -on -one player, get to the rack, and, you know, finish, go dunk on you or whatever like that. Um, so definitely was a more younger. When I was younger, uh, I was definitely more of a slasher. But once I start to get uh, more familiar with the game, I start getting older. And once I start getting years under my belt playing in the league, I was able to, you know, move my game around where though I can, you know, pick and choose my spots on the court where I can score from. It wasn't just all – everything drive and I was able to develop and work my um my J at the time and, and work on my long distance shot as well. So um but definitely I I consider myself a slasher for sure.
just curious, out of curiosity, I mean, one, one of the things that always stuck out to me about you was just like your ball handling, just how flashy you were, just you, you, everything you could do with your right hand, you could do with your left hand. I mean, you had finesse, you dunking, everything. Like, were you, I mean, nowadays kids are, you know, they're, they got the trainers, they're doing the skills and drills, they got the cones and all this and that. Like, how did you develop such a nice handle and just, you know, become such a nice ball, you know, a player, period? Did you have a trainer or were you just out playing? Or no, that's just us going out and just playing. You know, we, we didn't have trainers and everything is set up for the guys now. I mean, these guys have, you know, uh, professional trainers and everything to help them develop their game and, and work on their game. Us, we used to be in the middle of the street, middle of the block, it'd be 10, five players, 10, nine players or people out there playing. We got a basketball. We played from pole to pole. You had to dribble pole to pole to get through everybody. That's how you get a point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the game stuff. For, we play. Forget cones. I mean, it's real right. people. <laughs> right. It's real people. So you got to dribble through five, six people just to try to make it from, you know, pole to pole. And, and, and just how you get a point. You got to make it to the pole. So we do that. Yo, that's a, cool, that's, a good, that's a good neighborhood game to bring back, man. That's a good game sure. right there. For sure. the that's the stuff we used to do. I promise you. That's what we used to do as youngins. Wow. And, and we used to walk around dribble tennis ball. That's one of the things we used to do all the time, too. We just dribble a tennis ball everywhere we went. So, you know, once the basketball got in our hand, the basketball felt like a globe for real, for real, after getting finished dribbling a tennis ball all day long. So, wow. I mean, those are certain things that we had at the time that we did to work on our games. Plus, just playing pickup ball and playing every single day. You know, I was outside playing basketball all day long. I used to go outside and play ball from 12 to 8. You know what I mean? Then I come back in the house. I'm outside all day playing basketball. And that's the thing we used to do. I mean, the technology thing wasn't heavy as it is right now. So we used to always be out on that court again and then playing games. So I think that also helped as well. No doubt. All right. So I, w I want you to, I want you to take, take me back and take the viewers back. Um, I believe some of my most – memorable experiences and you know me growing up in Norristown what I would always hear came from like the summer leagues you know 16 Susquehanna or just you know so so tell me some of your most memorable experiences um tell me some of the leagues you played in you know summer leagues pickup ball courts different neighborhoods you know take me through that experience um top one is the Mecca for sure 33 and Diamond was was a was a major uh you know unlimited league that we played in coming up. And I was a youngin at the time playing, you know, 14, 15 years old. I was playing with grown men, playing the unlimited league there, and especially 16th Street, 16th Susquehanna. Um, as far as me playing, like, at a higher level than what I was playing at, I mean, as far as my age, I was 14, 15 years old when I first stepped out there to play on that unlimited stage with the grown men and stuff like that. Um, younger age playing within our age groups, positive image, um, ITZ, and a pile was probably the three strongest leagues that was around at the time we was coming up that had the most talent. I had a lot of teams from all different um, areas of the city that was playing that had different teams. It'd be like 30 different teams in the positive image, you know, with all the top players that was in our age group and stuff like that playing against one another. So um, those right there are probably the most memorable leagues I remember as far as being like the greatest and, and having the most memories from playing in. And uh, I felt as though it was like the top leagues in the city at the time. Yeah. What were um? Are there any moments? What are some classic moments that you think people still talk about to this day? Um, from all your experiences down 16, you know, Susquehanna, 33 Diamond, just you know, some mm -hmm. some, some things people still talk about to this day. Definitely the dunk I caught down 16th Street when I was young, and I ended up catching my OG. Shout out to Dominic Stevens, man. I don't pity my day like that, man. But I ended up <laughs> catching my, I get up catching my OG slipping, man. Had had a, a crazy. A crazy bang out. Uh, I didn't even expect it. I didn't even know I was going to do it, honestly. It was one of those plays where I had a chance to really get to the hole and just took off. And then, and once I took off, I just realized I was at the room. So, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was showtime of the day. You know what I mean, <laughs> so I really had a chance to, uh, it was a crazy dunk, had the crowd go crazy all day on 16th Street. That's probably one of the most memorable ones that I could think of that really people still talk about to this day, still ask me about. Remember this, man? You did this? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, that was, that was probably one of my little special moments down 60th Street. I think that's what really gave me my buzz and my name uh, in the city as far as playing basketball right then and there. For sure. What, and who were some of the um, – some of the, like, what, what, talk, talk about the talent level. Um, like when you – you know, in, in the 16 subsequent hand of games and – you know, uh, uh, 33rd Diamond, some of the other players that you was going up against night after night, some of the stacked teams. And, you know, I mean, what, what was the atmosphere like down there with, with the well, players? My first, my first team I played down there, I went down 14. I, I, I came along sad. Sad them put me on their team. Sad and champ. Uh -huh. So I was playing with uh, Sad, Hot Rod, uh, 
Ayo, um, Nardi Stewart, that we was wow. playing against uh, uh, everybody in the city down there. One of our toughest teams, I feel as though, and one of the toughest guards, I feel as though, was in the city at the time was Sean Colson. We used to play against Sean Colson. Um, and that Miami team, that was, they was a really, really, really tough team. That was a good battle down there. Then we had the South Philly team with Donnie Carr, Sue Butler, and them. Um, uh, they was all loaded. They had their teams, and it was it was other teams. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I can't just name all the names right now. And then just to me talking, I had to sit back and really think about it. But it was a lot of talent at the time. Everybody who was somebody played down the 16th Street at that time for mm -hmm. sure. Somebody, yeah. you, if you played basketball, you had a basketball name. You had the 16th <laughs> Street was like Philly's Ruckus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like New York Ruckus. You had to you had to play the 16th Street for for to get your stripes. As far as being marked as a as a tough ball player in the city. So um, I know for sure um, all the basketball players that came up around that time in the area felt the same way, where though if you didn't play at 16th Street, you really wasn't certified or really wasn't stamped as far as being a basketball player in the city at the time. Yeah. What, what, did you ever see or take notice, like, to any, like, college coaches coming down there, watching games? Did you ever hear about mm -hmm. anything like that? No, because at the time I wasn't really thinking about things like that. It was just basketball for me. I it was basketball, about, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You no know, college coaches coming to watch me, anything like that. I was in high school. So at the time, yeah. I'm, I'm sophomore high school down there playing. Yeah. 15 years old. So I wasn't – I was just happy just to go down there just to play. At the time, you know, we was worrying about going down there and seeing a female. We were worried about, man, of this course. be a gang of, of female. Course. You know what I mean? Of course. So we was just happy to go down there and play, you know what I mean, just to be in that atmosphere. And they always had good food and stuff down there as well, too. So yeah. us just to go down there and put a show on from the city, that was like our – I was our, our energizer for us to go down there and want to just play. Hey, so, I mean, these kids now, you know, all <laughs> kids know now – um, we have these memories, but all kids know now is like AU, all that kind of stuff. But just, just if you can describe the atmosphere, like, like the crowds of people when somebody would get crossed over, dunked on. I mean, what, what would the crowd do? Just to kind of describe the atmosphere, man, on, on a jumping night down 16th Street. Yeah, that was that was your motivation. You had to make the crowd go uh, wild, ooh, eyes, and all that. I mean, that was a that's what brought the handles and the crossover. That's what the Philly crossover out for real, for real. I mean, once you cross somebody and you make the crowd go crazy, everybody run on the court, jump on the court, you come down, <laughs> dunk on somebody, score somebody, and everybody just going wild. I mean, that was like fire. For, I mean, that was just that just energized you. you wanted to uh, help you go out there and just uh, be more confident. Just wanted to play basketball down there, man, because the atmosphere was so nice. And at the time, you know, it was um, it was a it was a big basketball city for for everybody, and the city came to them games to watch it because they know it's going to be great talent down there. It was going to be good games. So, you being able to go out there and ooh out of the crowd, I mean, like I said, it certifies you and that stands you for for us being one of the toughest players in the city. Yeah. One last thing before we transition out, and I ask you a few things uh, more details about high school. Um, tell 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 me about Sad I Watson, man, about his game and just you know this is just his 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 just what type of player he was. Tough man, tough guard. It was tough. Um, six five shooting guard man had a handle, had a, uh, a prolific game. Jay turn around back to the game basket man, and it was and it was was super poised. I mean, it seemed like you can never it's like speed him up or anything like that. You know what I'm saying he always played the game at his speed, and um, me playing against him and me coming up against him. I mean, me playing underneath him, you know, I had a chance to really watch him play for real, for real. He was, he was really, really good, man. Like, he was really, really good. I looked at him as being, like, the best player in, in the city at the time. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, before I got the chance to play with them, I used to always go to the games and watch them play when I was young, like 13, 12. So I used to always go to the games and watch them play down 33rd Street and 16th Street, man. Then finally getting a chance to play against him. And playing with him, I had a really – I had an opportunity to really uh, experience how good he really was for real, for real, man. He really could have played in a, in a professional level for real, for real, if he wanted to, but he was definitely super tough. He was somebody I felt as though was the best guard in the city at the time, was the best player in the city at the time, and he was somebody that I looked up too far as a basketball player for sure. Got you, got you. So let's um let's um I'll talk about a few more things about um your, your days at Mansion because uh, I mean it's tons of stuff to cover there. Uh, what, what were some of your most memorable experiences? Um, you know, playing. And you wait. You only played the three years. You didn't play as a freshman at Germantown, right? No. And then you came to Manchester and you played uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year. So right. through those, you know, through years, whether it's like um, big rivalry games, some of your, you know, big games for you, just anything you know, you, th things you remember about the, those days, kind of memorable experiences. Um, every game was, especially our home games, always. Uh, 
was a, a, a incredible experience. I think we had one of the best crowds in, in, in the public league for sure. Once you came to Strawberry Mansion game, you know, our crowd was always in the game. You know, it was nothing but standing room. People around the gym standing up to watch our game and stuff like that. People that even wasn't attending our school, you know, guys that was older who always wanted to come to our game and stuff like that. So, um, like I said, playing against grass was one of our biggest games um, always because I felt as though, like I said at the time, they had one of the best teams in the public league, if not in the city at the time. And I felt as though for us to get, like, over the hump and be considered as one of the best teams, we had to go through them. Um, even though we came up short both times we played against them, they were both playoff games. Um, it was always a great – it was great to go against them for a for because I think uh, I always thought they had the best talent in the public league as far as playing against them. But uh, other games that we'd always go at, diving was one of our robberies. It was a robbery game for a for They used to be jumping. You know, we were five minutes away from one another. So us playing against diving there and them when they came to Mansion was always a good game for us. Uh, Overbrook, we played Overbrook a lot of times while I was in high school against Naeem Crenshaw and them. Yes, uh, yes. Those was those was good games. Even when we played against, uh, I think was Dre Howard there my my sophomore year. I think Dre Howard was there my sophomore year. We played against them. Rest in peace, Dre Howard, man. I think I think he he we played against them my sophomore year. So, um, those are probably like the three three teams that really was more like rivalry games. Every time we played them, it was more personal than just basketball when we played them. Yeah, tell me about your, your your running mate Buzz. Um, you know he was he was definitely a legend. You know in his right. Tell me tell me a little bit, a little bit about Buzz, man. Just his game and him and him as a teammate. Buzz Farney, super tough. Uh, six three, handle and shoot the lights out the ball, man. He could shoot the ball um, at that age when he was in high school. I mean he 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 perfected his jump shot at a young age, man. He was lights out shooting the ball behind three point line. Um, Super competitive, man. It was a great teammate. That was my man, dog. And me me and him, our tandem, I feel as though, probably one of the best tandems ever to play in the public league, to be honest with you, man. Because, um, like I said, not only am I saying this, but, you know, people that came up in the area that was around that black squad time knew what me and him was bringing to the table where we game for us being a backcourt uh, tandem. So, um, you know, probably one of the best guys I played, played with as far as being my, my partner in, in crime on the court for real, for real, me and Buzz, so. Buzz, like I said, was super tough, man. He was he was scored a ball at ease, and he he was fearful of anything. So definitely was uh, somebody that I looked up to, and somebody I, I enjoyed playing alongside with. No doubt. Um. So after after um, I know a lot of, a lot of lot, a thing that was really big back back then was a lot of camps. You know, people. You know, if you weren't playing summer league hoops, you, you may did, did you go to any camps like A B C D? Were you doing any like those kind of camps or anything like that? Yeah, I went to A B C D. Okay. I went to ABCD in 96. Um, that was the year uh, T-Mac and Lamar Odom, they was the number one and two players at the time. And, you know, just going going to uh, the ABCD camp, playing against all the top players in, 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 in around the country uh, who was listed as, you know, top 100 players and stuff like that. That was a great experience for me as well. Um, I didn't, I didn't um, go to Nike camp, but uh, – when we played AAU out there in Vegas at the time, Nike King was going on. I had a chance to go through there and, you know, watch them guys play. That's some Baron Davis and all of them was there playing at the time. But, you know, yeah, Adidas camp, man, ABCD camp was was, was was special, man. Like I said, having the chance to play against the top players in the country and, you know, working out with them every day, going against and competing against them every day was a great experience for me, especially for me going into my senior year. Because that was between my uh, junior and my senior year. That was the summer gotcha. between my junior and my senior year. So, um Experience that, and then coming back to play my senior year, definitely, like I said, it, it motivated me more to be um, better, better player. I mentioned my senior year. Yeah, and, and AAU wise, you played for the Hunting Park team. Yes, I think um, Park. It's, a, it's a legendary photo that I have with with you and and you know your uh, I think Brad. You know, y'all's all on the same team, right? Yeah, me, yeah. Jared, Marquise, rest in peace, Mar Plummer, man, Eric Hood. Wow. Uh, Gerald Johnson, Cameron Milton, uh, who I'm missing. I'm missing some people. Marquise, I'm missing some people. Kirk King, uh, we played with Hunter Park, man. We played in the Vegas tournament. We played in the Long Beach tournament. We went away for uh, two weeks to play in that, the AU tournament. The first one was in Vegas. Um, I think we lost in the Final Four and the one in Vegas. But um, we ended up winning the championship and the one in Long Beach. 
And gotcha. we had to go up against uh, uh, what was the New York team called? New York, oh, I forget what they was called. But they had like, they had seven All Americans on their team: Lamar Odom. Was, oh snap! Wait, you serious? Lamar Odom, Kareem Sabash, Khalid Alamine, oh, Tony snap. League. I mean, we played them in the, in the, in, the, in the final four to go to the championship. And y'all, um, wow! And y'all beat them. Y'all went to the champion. Y'all won. We beat them. We beat them. I, uh, wow. Buzzer beat to win that game against them. We played against Lamar Odom. And them. Wait, wait, re repeat that. Cause it repeat that because it cut out. You said you hit the buzzer beater to win that. Yeah, we played. We played New York. We played Lamar Odom and them in the final four, and I, I, I hit a buzzer beater to, uh, to beat them to go on over. I mean, uh, to go to the championship game. So wow, that was that was a great experience for us. Man, we played against all the top players that was considered the top players in the country at the time in that in that AAU tournament. So that was a great experience for us as well. Oh, somebody said uh, maybe the name of the team was it the Long Island Panthers? Panthers, yeah, Panthers. Okay. That's my man Snook. He played on my Snook. What's up, Snook? No he played doubt. On my team with me. That's Gerald Johnson. Oh, what's up, Snook? Peace, respect to uh -huh. Gerald Johnson. That's what's up, man. Yeah. Dope. He, Appreciate he, that. He was he was on our squad. It was called Long Island Panthers. That's what it was called. That's what's up, man. Hey, so yeah. um, I know uh, once everybody's done playing um high school ball um you know for the season you know pub you know PIAA all that kind of stuff everybody would trickle down to Concha Hocken. Did you play down to Concha Hocken in the down? Yes, we played in Concha Hocken too. Like, what, how many years did you play down there? Different, different times. I played two years. I played two years. Two, two. I think it was two. I know for sure it was one. I might have. I think we played two years. I'm not. I'm not sure. I know we played in the one year for sure. Uh huh. I can't even remember the name of the team I played with in college hockey. That's crazy. Yeah. But we definitely played in college hockey, and I remember playing against the uh, New Jersey Roadrunners team. Tim Thomas and them. They had a squad. Yes. And matter of fact, uh, he played with, 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 with Shaheen Holloway playing with them then or no? I don't know. I can't. I, 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 I don't know if Shaheen played against. I know we played against um, our Harrington. I think I don't know if our Harrington was on that squad as well. I know we played well, he, against our Harrington. Al Harrington definitely was. On, he he, def, he definitely did play for the Road Runners over there. Yeah, that's who we played against. We played against our Harrington team because our Harrington was the, was the main uh, guy for that team at the time. Got you, got you. So just curious. Um, you talked about um going to Meridian. But what what happened in between? I guess first off, tell me about your college recruiting, like all the different schools that may have been recruiting you, and then what ultimately led you to going to to Meridian? Is that a JUCO? Yeah, so it's a junior college. Well, right. coming out coming out of high school, I was committed to UMass. I was going to go to UMass. Okay, that was that was Marcus Camby them last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up taking the test score. My last uh, the last time I could take it, I needed the eight twenty. I ended up getting a seven ninety in my test score. Okay. So I didn't get my test score to go play a Division one basketball. That's what forced me to go play a uh, junior college. Um, mm -hmm. After playing junior college, I was getting heavily recruited by uh, University of New Orleans. Here, 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 pause. My fault. Pause one second. So when you didn't get that grade and couldn't go to UMass, like, what was that experience like for you mentally? Like, did you get discouraged? Did you, like, say, oh, man, or, or would you just, like, all right, you know, different route, let's keep it moving? Um, you know, at the time, I was disappointed when I was young, you know. I was actually heartbroken at the time you know, that I didn't get the test score. Uh, being the fact that I only needed 31 points to make the test score to go play a Division One, I, I was, I mean, you know, I was heartbroken at the time when it happened. I was a little disappointed in myself. But at the time, I couldn't uh, just hold my head down and just, you know I mean, just not do nothing. I mean, I had to start looking at the next option, which was going to junior college. Uh -huh. So I had a chance to go around and visit a couple of junior colleges. I visited uh, Meridian, and I visited a junior college in Oklahoma. Uh, so it was between those two two schools where I was going to go to play junior college. Both was heavily ranked at the time in the country, as far as uh, nationally ranked. And um, only reason why I ended up choosing Meridian for real, for real, because at the time, the school I went to when I visited in Oklahoma, you really had to have like a a vehicle at the time to be there. I mean, okay. be where their school was at, because everything was so far apart from each other. Gotcha. Meridian, it was more like a city. It was more like a a little town, a little city where I was able to. You know, if I wanted to go get some needed something, I could go right across the parking lot, or whatever. It was a bunch of stores and, and you know, shopping centers and stuff like that where I really didn't need too much uh access to, like vehicles, stuff like that, where I was able to go around and be situated. So that's that's what really forced me to go to Meridian for real, for real. And um, you know, I, I actually enjoyed myself. Like I said, I enjoyed myself there. It was a good time. I played great two years there. I played against some uh, great talent. Some guys that end up into going to the league. We played against in junior college as well. So, like, like against, um, like uh, against other JUCOs. Yes, against other JUCOs. Like, sure. who, 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 some of the guys you remember possibly? Um, we played against. 
Indian Hills. We played in Indian Hills. Indian Hills was a powerhouse in Gene College at the time. I think uh uh what's Corey last night? I think it was Corey Hightower. Was his name Corey Hightower? He played with the Lakers. Uh he was a left hand guy from Michigan. He's from okay. Flint, Michigan. We played against them. We played against um a guy, I don't know if you remember, he played at DePaul. His name was Paul McPherson. Okay. He played at DePaul. He ended up playing in the league for Phoenix for a couple of years as well. We played against them. He played at uh Utah Dixie. Him and Maurice Baker, both of them made it to the league. Um we played against them at uh Utah Dixie. So um, those are just a couple names that I did play against people that made it to the league from playing in junior college that I played against. Gotcha. And, and so, and then earlier you you brought you <clears throat> just just revisit, re, revisit real quick um, what led to the Shawl experience um, just for the viewers that may not have been tuned in. Just real quick, and then just you know just relive a, a couple of the memories of Shaw, man. A couple of big games and kind of what that HBCU experience was again. Uh, like I said, I was introduced to. Uh, Shaw University by coming to uh, some of the OGs that that, that would play basketball here for Philly that actually attended Shaw University as well. Like I said, Dominique Stevens is the one who introduced me to the uh, coach from Shaw because they played together at uh, North Carolina Central at their time when they was playing basketball and the CIAA. So they actually played with each other. Uh, they was teammates playing at North Carolina Central. So um, them telling me about the history of the CIAA and, and you know, uh, the atmosphere and, and, and the richness that it had as far as being a, a HBCU, as far as being a historic black college. Um, like I said, I didn't really know too much about it. And once I got there and had a chance to spread as far as the tournament, you know, it was like 22,000 people there to come watch us play at the tournament and stuff yeah, like that. Cool. Talk about and we was in a, a, a like an NBA arena at the time. We played the game <laughs> stuff at, so it was it was it was something new for me. I never played in a big crowd like that before. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it, was, it was new for us. So you know, we were so excited by it. Then it was being held at the time in Raleigh, where, where our school was located at. So we was right around the corner. So we was the home team for real. Gotcha. Time. And thus, uh, us bringing the championship to Shaw University, where they never had won a championship before, okay. ever, and wow. in the basketball history. And us being the first team to bring a a championship home in uh, men's basketball as far as um, oh, yeah, double A. That, that was, was huge. That was, yes. That was Especially huge, for, man. you know, because my, my son goes to um, Virginia Union. Right. And, and so I know, like, for, for, for the Shaw alumni, all the old heads, I mean, I know right. you look like the goat down there. Right. At the <laughs> you know, time, you know, you know, guys, you know. Yeah. You know, they, they, the alumni um, actually showed us a lot of love while we was playing there, man. They showed us a lot of love. We used to go out of town and play, like, in Atlanta, we had a gang of alumni in Atlanta. Uh, Mr. Joe Jackson, uh, they used to show a lot of love for us when we came down. They used to set it up where they would go to their house. They prepared dinner for the team and stuff like that. We had a chance to meet, like, more alumni that attended Shaw before we did. And, and like I said, get to learn more about the history of Shaw University and, and the basketball program and stuff like that. So alumni always show support for us on away games, home games, you know, during tournament time and stuff like that. They always came and supported us. And all our games and everything we did. Yeah, what's what's up? Before we you know uh, tap out of Shaw, um, what's one of your most memorable experiences at Shaw? Whether it's a game, a highlight, something that made the crowd go crazy, or just you know, besides you know winning the championship, which is which is which is ultimate. Um, just something that was just you know something that people probably still talk about. Um, I just say we had a big game. Um, I believe we won the CIAA tournament. We went uh, straight to regions and played in the regional tournament for it to try to make the. Um, the NCAA tournament. So uh, we played against a school called Carson Newman. Uh, I'm familiar and with them, yep. We played Carson Newman at their school. It was the regional championship game. That was for us to go to the Elite Eight uh, at the NCAA tournament. So um, crazy atmosphere. We played against these guys, man. You know, we going into the gym, man. It's actually an all-white crowd in there. We go into the gym, and, you know, we listed as the underdog. They was nationally ranked. We was ranked as well, too, but we went in as the underdog. And um, it was it was a series. It was a game where, though, we were down 15 points in both halves. We wow. ended up being down 15 points in the first half and then going into halftime. We ended up cutting the lead, um, cutting the lead to, like, five or six, and then end up going back down 15 in the second half. Wow. Right? It was like. 12, 13 minutes left. Uh, we call a timeout with down 15. And Zach Words, coach, comes up to me and tell me, I'm going to need you to take this game over. This is Zach Words to me. I need you to take this game over. I'm putting the ball in your hand. Take this game over. Don't think about passing the ball. <laughs> no, nah, right. Don't think about passing the ball. 
Yeah, you know I mean nothing. I need you to, I need you to go in there and, and get us this win. We need this win. And I think, I think honestly, that probably was one of my, if not the best, um, basketball performance I had at Shawnee University. I ended up scoring like our last twenty five points or something like that to, 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 to win the game, and we ended up coming down and, and beating them in the stretch in the last couple seconds of the game. And I actually had the footage of that tape. I don't know what I did with that tape. Oh, <laughs> man, that would have been crazy, um, man. I, actually, I think I got it on a little – back then, I got it on a little VHS tape. I got a gang of them that's in my storage with yeah. all the games and stuff on there. I'm going to get them out because I'm supposed to be converting them over to DVDs. Please, but man. I, get I have, them. We got to bring them back to life, man. And I got about – I know I got about a good 30 games on, on tape. Yeah, I end up, God, I end up converting some of them over. Life, yeah, I end up converting some of them over. I'm, I'm going to get the footage, man. I need to find uh, somewhere I can get it where I can play it on. I can get uh, – I know you probably got the – I know you probably got the equipment for me to play the, the little tapes on there and stuff like that. Yeah. I can watch the game stuff like that. So, I'm going to get with you after this so I can Please. find out. Please. I know, I know I got that game because I kept that game on purpose because I saw that that was one of my best games I played. Yeah. So, I kept that game uh, for sure. So, I just gotta go through it and, and find it, but I know I got a lot of uh, Shaw footage, man. Old footage that I'm gonna bring out, man. I'm definitely please, gonna please. try to put it out and put it on YouTube or anything. Gotta like bring that, that back to life, it. man. <laughs> right, I got. I have to. I have to. Hey, and which That's year? True. I was doing some research earlier. Which year did you win the NABC um, D two Player of the Year? Was that your senior year? That was my senior year. Oh, two. Oh, got year. you. Got you. What, what was that like? Just to know that you were, you know, highly, you know, just you know, thought of to hey, this was the guy for this year, you know. Like I said, my, my junior year, after playing my junior year at Shaw and experience and what we went through, we ended up losing in a, um, in a tournament. And like I said, in the quarterfinals, I had a chip on my shoulder coming back uh, my senior year. I knew it was a couple of things that I did want to accomplish for me coming back. I definitely wanted to get the CIAA Player of the Year. I definitely wanted to get the CIAA Tournament Player of the Year. And Division Two Player of the Year was something that was on my list as well, something me and my coach was talking about. And it was something that he was trying to get me to uh, – he was pushing for me to get – far as playing uh my senior year so uh coming into my senior year that was that was some of the goals that was set personally for myself to try to go out and accomplish and be able to do and as far as me being able to go out there and really accomplish those goals and really put everything out there in the court and leave everything on the court um me getting that honor was like a refreshing uh feeling for me man i felt as though i really went out there and accomplished the goals that i set Aside, uh, you know, coming into that year and then going out and being able to accomplish it, and accomplish it, um, it was big for me. It was major for me, and I felt uh, like, you know, real proud about it. I mean, I felt though it was well deserved for one, and I felt as though I, I really put a lot of work in that off season for workouts and, and stuff like that, getting in shape, training. I put a lot of work in for me to come back and really, really be ready for me to play my last year. You know, this is gonna be my last year of me playing college basketball ever, so. I really wanted to leave everything out there on the floor and, and be able to go out there perform at a high level. No I doubt. Really, hey, I did that. hey, this is um a perfect time for me to segue. Um, I forgot to tell you at the top of the hour, Instagram only gives us our um sections. Um, okay. so they're, they're, they're about to count me down now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna end this one, um, save it, um, so I can upload it, and then um in like a minute, come you know rejoin again so we can then, then you know uh, send me another request or whatever, and then we'll continue. Um. We're going to, you know, talk about your NBA career and all that and, and beyond, and then I'll wrap up. And also, to the people tuning in, I appreciate y'all tuning in. Um, you tuned in to uh, Legends Week uh, grand finale, uh, my man Ronald Flip Murray. Um, at the end of this, uh, Flip, we're going to have a nice little q and I'm going to just let the people ask you some questions, you know, interact with the people a little bit, and um, we'll pretty much wrap it up from there. That's cool. Make sure y'all log back on. I'm logging right back on in a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. I'll be right back after these commercials. All right. All right, we back. Um, part two of the Ronald Flip Murray story here on Raw Sports Legends Week. Um, the first half, the first hour was crazy. Um, so uh, just make sure y'all, everybody tune back in. Uh, send the, if you can, send this um, send this uh, video to any friends and family because the second hour, se second hour is definitely going to be cr as, as crazy as the first. I'm going to get my man Flip back on. Hey, so before we uh, transition to the whole, you know, NBA draft and you just kind of, re you know, re reliving that and then talking about your NBA experience, um, what do you think about, um, I mean, how important was it for you or how dope was it for you to, to do what you did through the HBCU route 
And, and, and what do you think, um, I mean, what message do you have to send to, to other players, like younger players, who may exclude Division II, uh, uh, you know, HBCU, um, and say, you know, not, not thinking that they can get it done there to get, you know, to where they want to go. And um, I guess third part of that is, like, what if? I mean, I always think about, like, what if some of the top players, you know, in high school start start going to HBCUs? You know what I'm saying? So this is what do you think about that experience from you doing and then, you know, for the future generations? Um, honestly, the, the, the difference that I think is – Division one is 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 is, is more. Uh, how can I say it? Um, they're more on a, on, a, on a global atmosphere as far as um, you know sponsorships and you know um, TV and, and and all the TV games and stuff like that. I don't think it's 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 not a separation as far as, as talent wise it's a gang of talent in division one i just think the recognition as far as playing in, in division one and in, in d2 is, is a, it's a big separation it's a big separation actually we're working on actually working with a couple of people right now this 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 working on trying to get um trying to get more recognition as far as division two and hbcu as far as getting more sponsorships and stuff like that where though we can be on a bigger level as far as basketball and sports and where they can get recognized as players, as as if it was a, a Division One level and things like that. Um, me personally, I I enjoyed it playing at Division Two. I mean, don't get it twisted. I I always do what did want to play at Division One. Yeah, to play at that that, that level of <clears> basketball <throat> because it is the top players in the country or in 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 the world that's playing at that level. But in saying that, is also great talent and and great competition as well playing at Division Two. I'm not saying it's great as Division One because we all know that it's not because all the players is highly ranked and, and highly talented are getting recruited by these Division One schools who have, you know, big programs and, and big money behind them. I think that's the only difference between Division Two and, and Division One. Them programs have um, sponsorship and money behind them that a lot of people are not willing to give Division Two for and HBCUs and, and give us that type of recognition as well to be on that type of uh, platform as Division One is. But you know, I, I don't knock it. Um, I feel it though. Wherever you go, make the best of it. Whatever hand mm -hmm. you dealt, you play. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to a Division two school and still be able to get drafted and play at the highest level for the NBA. But I also made the best of my opportunity as well. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, have my head down or make no excuses or anything like that. As far as me going to Division two, never doubted myself either about me going to Division two. I know the reason why I was in Division two, and it wasn't because of the talent level or my basketball skills. You know, I messed up in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get my grades, so I know what it was as far as me not being to play at Division one. So that never was in like the back of my mind saying like I wasn't good enough to play at Division one because I knew I wasn't. Um, I knew I was able to play in Division one, but I just didn't have my grades. So. Um, People that's looking to play Division Two or Division Three basketball, go for it. If that's what you feel as though you want to do as far as your career, don't let nobody influence you to do anything else. Don't let nobody tell you anything else that it's not the right move or uh, I don't think you should do that because I don't think you're going to be getting highly recruited or getting recognition. If you're talented, trust me, they'll find you. Mm -hmm. They'll find you. Trust me, they'll find you. If you got the talent and you're making a uh, – an impression out there on scouts and, and, and teams, stuff like that. Other teams will start talking about you when you play against them. Other coaches will start talking about exactly. you. They'll start yeah. talking to people. And the word will get around. If, you, if you're talented, the word will get around. I don't care where you're playing at. So that always been my motto when I was at Division Two. I really didn't think about us playing, um, me not playing Division One. I. I wasn't going to be able to get, you know, seen or, or yeah. get recruited or anything like that. And plus, uh, just – I think that's a, a a bigger motivation, a bigger drive for you to try to exceed and try to even get there because I know it's a harder route now. You know, I didn't have the easy route. Every, nothing was given to me. Nothing was given to me as far as me trying to make my basketball career and make it to the NBA. I had to go out and work for it. I had to go grind for it. And I had to go out there and get an opportunity. And when I got the opportunity, I took my opportunity and, and went forward with it. So, like I say, anybody that's looking forward to going to play Division Two or Division One, Division Three, wherever you might go, just make sure you make the best of it. You get everything you got. Uh, continue to work hard. Continue to work on your craft and everything else to take care of yourself. No doubt. Just curious, out of curiosity, at what point did you start to realize? I know your coach believed in you at Shaw, but at what point did you start to realize that you had done enough to be considered 
for the NBA draft or, you know, to be considered, you know, I'm sure you know, you knew, you know, you could play at that level, but when did you think you did enough to impress people or to, you know, got enough, got, got the right clips of film together to be evaluated to play at the next level? Uh, my senior year playing and after my senior year, when I went out to Santa Monica and I started working out with all the top draft picks and, you know, doing those workouts, there's always a lot of scouts there and top scouts that's, uh, in the league and then top teams, stuff like that, be at those workouts and the top, uh, you know, uh, top uh, agents and everybody that's, that's that's there at the time. They're all there doing a workout. Me being able to go out there and hold my own against them every single day in the workouts, um, it really started to hit in like, all right, well, this is where I'm supposed to be for real for real. These guys, are, you know what I'm saying? These boys are supposed to be top recruits and then, you know, <laughs> lottery picks right here and I'm right at them. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was I was right at them every single day, and, yeah. and I knew who they was. They didn't know who I was before, uh -huh. before that started, but after it was over, they definitely knew who I was, and yeah. they definitely knew my name, and they definitely knew about me. So I I think at that point, once I started to work out with those guys every day, that was considered top draft picks and and uh, lottery picks. That it, I, I knew I could be. I knew I could play at this level. I knew I should be there. Yeah, how much of your you know the sixteen Susquehanna thirty thirty <laughs> diamond? kind of helped you just with that grittiness that I mean just you know did, did that play a part and help you just in your whole, your mindset your attitude you know what I mean you already know I don't think it's no more pressure than you have to go out there and play it at 16th street and especially <laughs> if you're playing on teams I was playing for when they when they betting 25 50 thousand on the game and you gotta you know what I'm saying <laughs> you know what I mean you got to you know what I'm saying like you you put you out there to go out there you got to perform you know what I'm saying there's money on the line you know what I'm saying everybody's out there to play they bet for twenty five, fifty thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying that's pressure for you right there alone. Yeah, and knowing what type of stuff that can happen after the game, something that's <laughs> right. So you already know. Yeah, you know I mean, so <laughs> that that definitely prepared you coming up playing in this atmosphere in Philly, and you know playing against guys like this. If you could play against, I mean, if you could play in a Philly crowd and and, and go through everything, and all the criticism that everybody going to shoot at you during the Philly crowd and Philly game, you could play anywhere. <laughs> so that really wasn't really a factor for me, for for me just being able to be there and have an opportunity to showcase my talent is what I was really worrying about. And that's the opportunity I wanted to get. And once I got it, I just took full advantage of it and just went with it. No doubt. Um, you, your, your story and your – um, every, everybody has a different path um, in which, you know, uh, like regarding like the NBA, if you talk to like 50 different players, you know, you'll probably hear like, you know, 25, you know, 20 different stories as far as – ways guys have gotten to where they've gotten and your, your story and your path is really inspirational because you know you're in high school and you didn't make the grade which is common you didn't hit you didn't uh, hang your head down you go to the junior college and then even after that you know you, you you come home and then you you wind up at Shaw player of the year after all that which is a non-traditional route to get there and now all of a sudden just, just relive that night or that day or whatever that you were at your house with your family you know, watching the NBA draft, like re relive that experience for me, man. And then what it was like when you when your name was called. It was a relief of joy, man. Like I said, because me knowing what I went through to get there, and me knowing what I had to do to even have my name mentioned in the draft, or even me have an opportunity to get drafted, man. It was it was hard work. Like I told you, I had to go to seventeen different workouts in a two and a half, three week period as far as pre draft workout to work out for seventeen different teams. Then had to come home. The draft was on Thursday. My last workout was with the Sixers on that Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, last workout for Tuesday, the draft is Thursday. I'd be cool. I'd be at the crib from there on now. I could relax. I end up getting a call from my agent. San Antonio wants you to come out there and work out for him. This was Wednesday. This was the, this was Tuesday night. And Wednesday, they wanted me to come out there to work out on draft day. So I had to go and work out the Wednesday before the draft in San Antonio, um, prior to the draft and stuff like that, I had to jump on a flight real quick to go out there and get this last workout in. Because they was supposed to be, was wanted to draft me at 20. They had the 29th pick. They had the okay. 29th pick in the first draft, in the first round. So they was telling my agent they was looking at me at, at that pick. So it wasn't nothing guaranteed, but they definitely was looking at me to, to take me there at that pick first round. They ended up taking John Simon with that pick, though. John Simon. Wow. So shout out to John Simon. Yeah. They, they ended up taking John that pick right there. So just me being through all that, through that, all that, I mean, 
adversity, me coming from a Division two school, not playing at Division one, really, when I didn't have a big name or anything like that, I was really an underdog coming into the draft and as far as the workout and stuff like that, then putting in all the work, the training, um, you know, the conditioning and uh, everything I had to do just to get my mind, my mind, my body right as far as, uh, you know, get, getting ready for this draft. It, it really was a breath of fresh air once I heard my name get called. You know, I really got drafted, man. I had a chance to experience it with my family and all my friends at the time that was there at the house with me, man. Um, and just to see the, 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 the joy and the happiness in my mom's eyes, man, when my name got called, man, that was special for me as well because I know how she felt about me as far as her son and me being – in a position that I've been in as far as trying to play basketball and wanting to make the NBA since I was a young. And so just to see her, you know, happy and proud of me at that time for me getting drafted was special for me as well, too. No doubt. So um, just tell me um, as much as you want about your NBA experience, man, from uh, the teams you played on, players you played with, toughest players you played against, any memorable experiences from, from the league? Um, I had a chance to play against and with a lot of great players. Uh, Rookie year, had a chance to play again, play with a lot of great veterans. I had a, a great veteran nucleus um, with Milwaukee, uh, guys that really took took me under their wings and really showed me the ropes of the NBA, showed me the nature of the NBA, showed me the business of the NBA, and how to be um, how to be a professional uh, at that level. Man, I had to take my head off of those guys. Man, Sam Cassell, Ray Allen. Um, Tim Thomas, Irvin Johnson, rest in peace, my man, my OG, Anthony Mason, um, Jason Caffey, um, Kevin Nolly, these guys that, that was, uh, you know, veterans at the time when I came in as rookies. And, you know, the, since the first day I stepped in there, they showed nothing but love. I mean, they, they, they give you your rookie treatment and stuff like that, but on, on, on a real note and, and, and just to keep it thorough with me, man, it was, it was, it was all love because they definitely took me under their wing and they really, Embraced me as a rookie, and you know I mean, they not only was my team, but we became real, real close friends. Um, had a chance to play against, with, I mean, play on the same team with LeBron when he was a youngin, um, 05, 06 year. Um, that was a great experience, me being able to play with him. I mean, we was on TV every day playing. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was that like, man? Stay there for a second. Tell me what that experience was like playing that's with just, LeBron and King James, man. King it, man. James and Flip, man. Listen, man, that's it's, it's A1 with King James. You hear me? A1. I'm talking about media. We was on TV. Like I said, we played TV games every game we was on TV. <laughs> if not every other game, we was on TV playing. So me being able to play with experience as far as playing with a superstar in the league, if not uh, one of the best players in the league at the time, the face of the NBA at the time. Well, Kobe was really the face at the, at the time. But you know LeBron was was next up. You know what I'm saying? So every everything was focused on him. Everything was focused around him. So far as the Cleveland Cavaliers, the team getting attention, I was able to go out and showcase because we was always on TV. <laughs> so family had a chance to really see all my games. Now I mean, he didn't need an NBA pass no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we was yeah, you know I mean we was on TV every single night. So uh, that was a great experience. Me being able to play with him as well, playing on the same team with him, and then. My Detroit team, man, I think that's one of the best teams I ever played on, man. Um, the camaraderie, the, the 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 love that everybody had for one another, and, you know, the the chemistry everybody had once I got there. You know, this was right after – I got there right after they just uh, won a chip and they lost in the next year. They lost. Was that, was that right? Sheed, Chauncey, Chauncey, and Rip Chauncey, and everybody? Rip, Tayshaun. Tayshaun uh, Prince, yep. She McDice. Dell Davis, Lindsey Hunter. Uh, you know, I had another uh, a strong veteran nucleus team that was there. And when I say, like, that circle, that whole circle and that whole organization was tight, I'm talking about that whole that whole team was tight. Like, in, anytime we was, was doing Was Ben something. Wallace on that team, too? No, Ben Wallace ended up getting traded. He went to Chicago. That's when he just signed that deal. Okay, gotcha. That's when he just signed that big deal. So, Ben wasn't there. I had a chance to play with Ben Wallace. He was another HBCU player, too. He went exactly. to the yep. So, he, was, he wasn't there. But, you know, I still – he always showed love once I got in the league. Every time I talked to him, what's up, Shaw, you? You know what I mean? You know, he showed that, that CIAA love. Always, right. always. He always showed love. <laughs> always. So, that was that was uh, another great, great team that I played for. I felt like that was, was some of my best time playing in the NBA as well. Mm-hmm. Um, any, um, just any, um, let me see what, um, who's the, who's the, tough, the toughest player you had to guard, you think? 
in the league? Um, toughest guards. Uh, that time I, I have to go with AI. No, no, but like no toughest players that you had to defend. I have to go with AI. Oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go with AI. I have to go with uh, Agent Zero. I gotta go with Gil. Um, I have to go with. Um, I'm trying to see somebody I, I was having to always play against. Like I had a chance, we had to play against Gilbert in the, in the playoff. Uh-huh. So I was I was playing against him, uh, playing against him and guard him throughout the whole playoff series when I was with Cleveland. So he was definitely a hard guard. He was, he was somebody that was super tough, strong, athletic, could shoot the ball, uh, crazy handle, and was super fast. And you know, was fearless. You know, he, he had an ultimate green light at DC. So. You know what I'm saying? You always had to be ready to come up and, and play against them when you played against them because you know what he's going to bring to the table and what he's going to bring to the game every single time. AI, same way, super fast, wasn't as strong. Hey Flip, if you can hear me, just uh just X out and then I'll 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 bring you back in. We got a bad connection possibly on my end or your end, either one. Let's see if we can get Flip right back on. Minor technical difficulties on Instagram. You know how Instagram do. Let me see. If you tune, if you tuned in, watching, uh, listening to the story of Ronald Flip Murray, um, he's actually currently talking about his uh, NBA experience. We're gonna see if we can get him right back on. Wait for a man, Ronald Flip Murray, to rejoin us. Um, we're going to wrap up. Um, you know, once he once he rejoins, we're going to wrap up talking about uh, his NBA experience. Um, just you know, have him give uh, some keys to success to, to some younger ballers, and we're going to have a nice uh, Q and A with the people. <clears throat> You with me? Can you hear me? Yeah, my bad. My phone died. My bad. Oh, no doubt. It's all good. It's all good. Um, I think we, I think you was just talking about um some of the toughest players you had to guard. I think that's kind right. of where, where you ended out. Yeah, right. Like I said, Gilbert Reynolds and AI was probably one of the, the two toughest guards I had to play against and had to guard. And it was somebody – I mean, it was two players that you really had to be – you mean, locked in and, and – <laughs> Be be ready and be ready to go at it all night with them because they nonstop right at you every single night. So, no it was doubt, definitely two of the toughest guards I had to guard for sure. What, what's one of your um, one or two or just any of your most memorable games um, you had um, in the NBA in your entire career? You know, like I said, like I, that that Minnesota game is going to always stick with me when I was. Oh, there. that's right, that's right. When I was able to hit that buzzer beater and, and, and win the game, uh, that's one of the, the time where the fellas go. If I had the opportunity to be a starter in the league, I'd know exactly what I'd do to this league if I had this opportunity. But also understanding that it's a business and how does it get ran, I was taught that coming into the league. So I understood the, the situation that I was in, and I was just grateful for the opportunity that I had to be out there playing. So, But me knowing for sure if I had the opportunity that they was having, you know, to, to be out there, be a starter, and play every day, I would have really, really put some work in for sure. Yeah, and just, just out of curiosity, did you ever um, run into any adversity in the NBA, and or um, was it was it was it um, discouraging at all? Like you know, playing for several different teams, or like when you, when you, you know times you or, or or that was just you know enhancing. You just just went with the flow and just enjoyed it. 
like I said, I was schooled to the game before I got there, so I understood the business of the game. The business side, got gotcha. right. I knew exactly what it was heading for. I knew my purpose of being a, on, on the team that I was on. I knew when I wasn't wanted on a team. When I say wanted, but I knew when I wasn't getting the opportunity to play basketball. And at the time, I was able to, you know, go with my age and to sit down with the team or the, or the organization and let them know, like, listen, things ain't working here with us. I mean, find me somewhere where I can go and be able to play. So uh -huh. I understood the game. I understood the business side of it. So, so it was never really nothing personal. You, you, it you was never nothing personal. It was gotcha. never nothing personal. Never. Because I knew exactly what it was about. I knew what it was. I knew I wasn't a, a franchise player or franchise tag or anything like that. So I knew everything wasn't going to be hand to me. And I had to work for my, my, my opportunity to play, which I was cool with. So I really never got discouraged. I mean, discouraged by none of that stuff. I knew for a fact if I was able the opportunity to go out there and start and, and play 40 minutes a game, I knew exactly what I was able to do. And I was able to showcase that when I was given that opportunity to play them 40 minutes a game and stuff like that. So it was never discouraging at all. Got you. Um, just curious, um, before we transition from talking about the NBA, um, how and why um, did your like, – at what point did your NBA career end and in your mindset, say, okay, you know, now, now, you know, now's for me to talk. Now it's time for me to transition, you know, from the NBA and, and do something else. Um, after my last year playing uh, in Chicago, I was uh, actually um, going to play with uh, New Orleans at the time, and um, Monty was the coach there. Monty Williams was the coach there. Monty ended up calling me. And let me know they was interested as far as me bringing me in as free agent and, and playing. And then it was um, something that, that ended up coming out. And I ended up getting a call from Larry Brown. You know, Larry Brown was my coach at, at uh, he was my coach at uh, Charlotte when I was playing in Charlotte. I played in uh -huh. Charlotte for a little stint for Charlotte. So Larry Brown calls me out of nowhere, man. He tells me, Flip, he might be upset with me, man. But he, I don't know what he did. He ended up saying something to Monty Williams because, you know, he ended up telling him something like Flip has – he's always upset or he when you take him out the game, he never wants to come out the game. or And he said something like that. He said, I, I told him that, and it might hurt you coming down the line. Wow. This is what he told me on the phone call. He told me, he said, it might hurt you coming down the line. He said, man, I'm sorry if it does. If there's anything I could do for you as far as your career or anything like that, Please let me know. Call me. Right then and there, I knew I wasn't going to be playing NBA no more. I knew wow. it. I knew it because I know how the business go. I, he done said something to this team or this coach or something that, that, that's put a name on me now and where there's no team now wants to even try to deal with me or even have another chance with me or something. So at that time, I knew it was over. It was a done deal. It's the, it's the, it's the league. It's the business. It's, that's when the blackmail and all that stuff come in. People be talking about is is real. It's real. So, at that time, I knew it was a done deal. I had to look for another situation, another route to go. So, I ended up going to play overseas. I played overseas for four years prior, I mean, after my NBA career. And then once I played that, I knew it was a, it was a done deal. I mean, it was what it was. I took what I, I could take from it. I had a great time. My experience being there, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's no hard feelings, nothing like that towards Larry and nothing like that. But I knew once he told me that, I knew something fishy was going to happen, and it really was going to be hard for me to get back on the NBA team. Yeah, what what was the uh, overseas experience like for you? Was it was it a fun? You know, was it a pleasurable? Was it a fun experience? You know, hooping? No, it was fun. It was cool because I had a chance to really travel the world for one. I went to go see it, uh, three. I went to play it in Lebanon. I played in Turkey. I played in the Ukraine. So um, me having a chance to go over there and you know visit that that side of the world and experience that side of the world with some. Something great for me. I enjoyed it. Uh, then getting a chance to play against uh, international players and playing a style of basketball was something different as well. So I enjoyed that as well. So I mean, it was what it was. It was still a, I still considered it as a job. It was a, it was a source of income. So I went over there and got busy and played and, and took what I I got from it and just made the best of it. No doubt, no doubt. So uh, before we um we we, we transition um we're actually before we wrap up, I have like you know two more two two three more questions for you. Um, I appreciate. I just want to say uh, again, I appreciate all the all the viewers tuned in. Um, if y'all can start start getting y'all questions ready, people. Um, I'm gonna let y'all interact with Flip uh, in a second. Let y'all ask him just you know a barrage of questions. See my niece on here. Yeah. Oh, your niece? No doubt. That's what's up. Jay. What's up, Matt Jay? No doubt. That's what's up. Got fam on here. Um, what has your 
what, what has your basketball experience um, taught you? What has basketball taught you about life? What, you know, what have you learned from your experience, or, you know, throughout your life? Um, hard work, dedication, desire, all plays a part in basketball. It's part of life as well. Um, the things that I wanted to accomplish in basketball, the things that I had to do to accomplish my goals and, and set goals and standards as far as basketball and playing sports is, is life. Is life um, things that you go through in life as well. As far as being a person, as far as being a man, as far as being a father, um, those are stuff that help you grow as a man. Stuff that um, will be always installed in you. As far as being a person, just just to be, um, you know, just to be going through everyday stuff. As far as being in the world and things like that. So, you know, just 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 everything. As far as the teamwork, learning how to uh, work with others, and you know, learn how to communicate with others. All stuff that prepares you as far as being. Just in life, period, in, in general. So, um, I think with sports and with basketball, it helped me. Who they helped me be the man who I am today. It uh, motivated me to be the person I am today, and I think it's going to continue to do that as long as I live. No doubt, I, and, and I know for sure it's definitely some um, some younger, like younger uh, high school players watching this right now, or college players watching <laughs> this right now, um, or that may watch it later on YouTube. What advice would you have for those young guys who are trying to get where you? been already um you know they may they may get discouraged or you know whatever all oh, i i ain't accepting no d2 offers or just whatever, whatever the situation is what advice would you have for some younger players coming up now um continue continue to work on your craft continue to stay in that gym continue to stay motivated whatever the situation that you're in uh whether it's a situation you want to be in or a situation that you're in just continue to uh, work hard, continue to motivate yourself, continue to push yourself, and continue to believe in yourself and know that anything that you want to do or anything that you want to be or uh, anywhere that you want to be at as far as your basketball career, know that you can get there, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of uh, dedication. And, um, you know, I just hope that what I did as far as my career and me coming up the way I, I ended the game and how I got into the game, motivates a lot of kids now or uh, people that came up behind me um, to push them and want to do do better for themselves and push them to want to work harder and try to make it a uh, positive and, and not a negative and just be a, uh, inspirational to other people as well as you do the same thing. No doubt, no doubt. Well, um, that's pretty much all the questions I have, man. Just uh, Again, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me the time to, you know, come on the platform, you know, here on Legends Week and Raw Sports and share your story. This is, you know, this has been something that I've wanted to, um, do for, for years, you know, to, to finally have the opportunity to sit down with you, man. So thank you Appreciate for the it, opportunity. Man. Thank you for the support of the movement. You know, whenever whenever I see you out in the community or at a game, down the Alumni League, I saw you down for Dots, man, came support you. Um, it's always love. You've always been a smile and a handshake, man. So thank you so much. That means a lot to me, man. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, Star. You already know. You already know. Yes, sir. All right, people, it's your turn, man. Um, Start asking my man Flip some questions, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, start throwing some questions at my man Flip, and he's going to answer them right here on the spot. Um, I got a question real quick. Um, that was my question. Um, 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 about the NBA, do you guys get, um, like, like sometimes like, I, I see LeBron, like, you know, take his jersey off, throw it in the crowd, or, or sneakers off, throw them in the crowd. Do y'all, like, would y'all get, like, brand new, y'all playing brand new pair of sneakers every game or get, like, have just random, you know, tons of jerseys on deck in case you throw them in the crowd? Or how does that work? No, everybody uh, usually has a basketball sneaker contract. Has a sneaker contract, so oh yeah, yeah. Uh, once yeah. you're in a contract, they 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 send you loads of shipments of shoes. Yeah, so <laughs> you you'll have a gang of in in the trainers room or in the section. You'll have a gang of sneakers in there, and and you have different variety of sneakers you can choose and 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 pick from that you want to play in. And usually on a road trip, you'll take about three or four pair of sneaks with you just in case, you know, gotcha. have a malfunction or anything like that. Gotcha. Like, uh, change the sneaks and stuff like that. So everybody has a lot of a lot of sneakers that they just have in, the, in their closet. Yeah, so so, so throw, at the end of the game, throwing your sneaks up, that ain't no big deal. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, they send you they send you boxes and shiploads of sneakers, so you, you have a gang of them. Like, they send you. 15 to 20 pair of sneakers at one time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. So you'd be looking to get rid of some. No, just so you know I mean, just, just in case there be any type of malfunction or anything like that. You know, people want to have new sneaks or or just be playing in, in, in top notch sneaks. You don't want to play in no weird out sneaks where you get injured or anything like that. So it's no, always no. good to have, you know, a fresh pair of sneaks to play in. 
Um, Philly Blaze two one five wanted to know. He said, "You know the um, you mentioned the toughest player you had to guard in the NBA. Um, who's the toughest player you had to guard in the city um, coming up? Toughest player that I had to guard in the city coming up. I got. I have to go with Sean Colson, man. I have to go with Sean Colson. At the time, like I said, playing in that 16th Street era and that 33rd Street era, uh, Sean Colson, the high ride, was probably two of the toughest guards to guard because they both was extremely fast. They both had stupid handles, and they both – Sean Colson could score the ball with the best of them. Mm -hmm. And he was somebody I always looked up to as a young and too far as being one of the toughest and one of the best players to play against. Uh, coming up when I was a young boy, so I'm gonna have to go with those two for sure. No doubt, uh, Mr. J. Clay Toned Tone Med wants to know. Um, how, oh, on the flip side, um, how does it make you feel when, like, just imagine if it's some NBA players like Allen Iverson, you know, getting interviewed, and somebody asks him, "Yo, AI, who's some of the toughest players you had to guard?" And they may mention you. Um, how does that make you feel hearing that? I just love, man. That's that me know that you know I I, I put in some work, and they they recognize. Uh, type of player that I was, man, even though me being an underdog and not having a big name for people to come out in the store, mention my name as one of the best players or one of the toughest guards when coming as a guard. Um, I look at that as love and I look at it as a respect, as a mutual respect as well. So um, people say stuff like that, man. It, it just inspired me and let me know that I really, really was out there really putting in work and I really was, you know, going that guy's for real, for real. No doubt. Um, Keith 219, um, I think this is something you mentioned earlier, but just kind of re revisit it real quick for him. Um, who are some? Who, who are the top five players you've seen in Philly? Top five? Yep. Sad. Yah Davis. Sean Colson. She Bay. She Wallace. And that's five? Yeah, I think that was five. Yep. That's five? Yep, that was five. Um, somebody else wants to know, um, if you were in the NGA, NBA draft this year with the same stats, same college, uh, where do you think, you know, you get you get drafted? I don't know. That's, that's a tough one right now, the way it's going on now. Yeah. I know for sure if I was in this draft class right now, I know my contracts would have been way healthier where they were. <laughs> <in Boston>, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> And they throwing that they throwing that money to guys that they really ain't even like that, but they they giving that bread away right now, though, for sure. But I don't know. It depends. It depends on where I was at. And I, I, I don't know. Gotcha. I'll probably, probably be in, in the same in the bracket. But I don't know. I'll probably be in first round. I don't know. Gotcha. Um, Maddie Ice two one five wants to know uh, when was the first time? When was the first game um, you had that you felt that you was just on fire and couldn't miss? Um. I have to say, actually, the the the, the game we played um, my second year in Seattle, we played in um, Japan. We ended up playing two exhibition games in Japan against the uh, Los Angeles Clippers. And that first game we played them, man, that was my first time starting me playing and playing in the starting lineup. Man, I had up end up having like twenty five, and I went like probably like nine for 13 or something like that from Phil. And I, I felt as though I was comfortable out there where I was into the rhythm of the game and everything was, was, was seeming very easy for me to come out there and score. So uh, that probably was the start off game. And then after that, just that whole run, that whole stretch, where I was able to start for Seattle and I was in that start line and I ended up being like number five in the league in scoring. I was like fifth in the league in scoring. That whole stretch, that whole run, I just felt the most comfortable as far as me being an NBA player and me just going out there and just playing my game and really didn't have to look over my shoulder as far as getting pulled by the coach or anything like that, where I could just go out there and just play my game. I could go out there and make the mistakes and just, you know what I mean, learn from them and just, and just play my game. So I'm going to say that, that stretch is, is probably the, the, the most meaningful to me, that, that stretch when I was with Seattle. Gotcha. My man Steve um, Costello wants to know, um, can you speak to, yeah, can you speak to uh, one of your, can you speak to the younger viewers on the professionalism aspect needed to stay in the league? Uh, always conduct yourself accordingly. Um, don't ever get caught up in the hype. I mean, don't get beside yourself. Don't get the big head. Know that uh, as quick as you got there, and and and, and you making the team, the quickest you can get out of there as well. They'll get you right out of there as well. No. <laughs> so always, I mean, so always conduct yourself professionally as a businessman. Always look at it as a business. 
Um, and understand the opportunity that you have is not given to everybody. It's only given to a couple people. It's only given to special people. So make the most of it. Enjoy it. And just, you know, embrace it and have fun. No doubt. Uh, Chink the Barber wants to know, um, can you name a player from Philly you think should have made it to the league but didn't? A player I think should have made it to the league that didn't. Yeah, Davis, man. I keep I, – I, I I was a big fan of Yad Davis, man. I was a young boy. I ain't going to lie. I was a big fan of Yad Davis, man. I don't even know if he knows this, man. But I showed him love one time. I seen him. I let him know. But yeah, yeah, I was somebody who I thought was already an NBA player in high school. You know what I'm saying? Because he had the NBA game. He had the NBA body. And he was super tough, man. He was fearless. He was fearless, man. He, and I, I just always respected him as a basketball player coming up. Uh, underneath him playing like two years behind him. I always thought that Yah was one of the best players in the city for sure. And I felt as though if he had his, his head right and if he had approached the game uh, in a different way, that he definitely would have been in the NBA for sure. Gotcha. Um, KD Trainer, he's a trainer. He wants to know, uh, what was uh, your typical training routine daily, if you had one? Um, well, I actually had a, a personal trainer um, when I was playing. When, when I was in the league playing, so that would consist of <clears throat> the beginning of the summer was mostly um, calisthenics. Like I was with a speed and um, I was with a, uh, a speed conditioner. I mean, uh, training. What's Coach Tone? Name? I was with Coach Tone working on my agility and stuff like that. As far as um, beginning of the season, then like as we got closer towards season in the uh, summer, I would do more basketball court stuff on the court. Uh, as far as working out on my game and stuff like that. But I always try to hit the track and stay in condition. I mean, stay in shape as far as when the season started. I knew that um, I would be in shape. I would be able to run all day up and down that court. So uh, conditioning was definitely the most as far as being on the track. I was on the track a lot. Just working on the track, just getting my win and, you know, getting my footsteps right and stuff like that. Um, it was something that, that, that was big for me when I got back to the season. Got you. Um, Sweet Man215 uh, wants to know, um, Just talk, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, because I think um, one of the things, one of the themes that you talked about earlier on was having, you know, really good veterans uh, that kind of took you under their wing. Um, he just wants to know uh, uh, just the effects of having veterans, you know, when you, edit, you know, some solid veterans or when you enter the league. Uh, it helps you a lot. Like I said, when you're coming in uh, blindfolded as a rookie, not really knowing too much about the uh, NBA, and not to, and not knowing what to expect coming in as a rookie, having those type of veterans that I had when I was with Milwaukee, it makes your journey and makes your rookie season way more easier uh, than others because, they're, like I said, they're showing you the ropes and let you know exactly what to expect, how to conduct yourself, and, and you know how to enter and approach this opportunity that's given to you. That, like I said, it's not given to a lot of people. So. Having those type of guys to guide you and really showing you the ropes was something big for me. And I think every team, every veteran that's on NBA team should show the same as uh, same love to all the rookies that come in uh, every single year. It's looking for like guidance and advice as far as how to be successful and how to be a professional basketball player. No doubt. Um, I think that's pretty much it, man. I just have one, one question, something I was curious about. I mean, so you come up as a baller, you know, watching NBA, obviously a fan of NBA, you know what I'm saying, but you're a player yourself. So when you get to the league, did you have any kind of like starstruck moments like in your mind, like, oh my God, they go, they go Shaq or, you know, they go such and such or, or, or it was not strictly business we all hear and I'm just no, here at work. Not even that. I think only, only time I really was, was like that was my rookie year. When, when it was Jordan's last year. We played against them when he was with the Wizards mm -hmm. and I wanted his sneaks bad after the game. I wanted to have his sneaks bad after the game because that was his last season. And, you know, he was doing his farewell tour uh, every time he came to everybody at Reels and stuff like that. And I wasn't able to get a sneak. But far as starstruck being, like, out there in the court with nobody, I really didn't look at nobody like that. I looked at like basketball players for real, for real, because they're doing the same thing I'm out there doing. So I wasn't really starstruck. I mean, even though those guys that I looked up to and watched playing before, prior to me getting there, once I got there, it was like, man, all right, I'm at you now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it ain't, I mean, it ain't, it, ain't, it ain't like I was when I was watching on TV now. Yeah, you're like, yo, can I get your autograph? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I wasn't on that time. You know what I'm saying? No, it's tech ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It, it, was, it was all up. But Mike, I ain't going to lie, my, 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 rookie, my rookie season when we played them, I definitely wanted his sneaks after the game, and I wasn't able to get him. I think he gave him a Sam, I think. He gave him somebody else. Oh, but I definitely man. was trying to get a sneak, though, for sure. <laughs> I was that would have been legendary to get one of MJ's shoes for, for right. your collection. You know what I mean? 
No doubt. Uh, last question from the people, then we're going we're gonna to tune out. Um, Mr. Capricorn, 1231, this might be special. Do you remember the song before every game in high school? There's plenty of them. She already know. You already know. Uh, I had a gang. I had a gang of songs, man. What did they were that they would play when y'all was coming out too, or something? No, they used to make they used to remix like uh, hip hop songs, and, and they would add me and Buzz into the song, and they would oh, make their, snap. they would oh. come up with their own. You know what I'm saying? They would put their own words and their own lines oh, and that's stuff. Dope. <laughs> so they had a. Remember when Biggie had the song "We'll Always Love"? Yeah, yeah. They had that song "We'll Always Love" with Mary. Oh, that's good. Uh, I mean, uh, they had the other Biggie song, the Juicy Remix, and they had put me and Buzz. Now, I mean, they came up with a gang of songs. They had a gang of songs for me and Buzz. That's hot. So the fans up. were single, or they was like one, like what, like I mean, like how, like how would it be? I can't remember. I can't remember because I, I mean, they used to say my. I can't I can't remember exactly the word for word right now, but I know. No, I'm, I'm saying like that. was it was it like recorded like when they were playing on, on the speaker? No, no, or? no. Nobody really put it on wax or recorded nothing like that. But they used to always recite it and stuff like just, that. Just just recite it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My man Nate Price actually when we started. I know Nate Price was just well, he he let me know exactly how it go. He made more, majority of them up. Uh, they said he said I'm talking about in the locker room. No, I, I'm what he. I'm talking about in the locker room. What song he used to play? What would he say? I Do you think... remember the song before every game in high school? No, nah, I don't know what he's talking about. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> hey, well, um, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate your time again, man. Um, before we tune out, man, is there anything that you would like to mention that we didn't talk about, or just you know, any any last words or any shout outs? Um, nothing, man. Just uh, just for up and coming players, man. I know there's a lot of stuff going on right now with this pandemic, man. And and a lot of stuff that's going around the country right now. I want everybody to stay focused, man. I understand it's a bigger picture of everything that's going on out there. Plus, everybody's out here doing all this dumb stuff for our just riding and and it's looting and, and breaking the stores stuff like that. As a people, we all need to come together, man, and really understand something serious that's going on behind us. Is the bigger picture of what they're showing us right now. I need everybody to understand that and just 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 trying to concentrate and 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 be around your loved ones at the time and and. Understand what's going on right now. It's not going to be forever. It's not going to last long. We're going to get through this, man. And it's it's crazy the stuff that's going on right now. But we have to be smarter as people, man. And we have to come together more stronger as people right now because we need one another right now. Because um, the stuff that's going on right now with us in this government is it's a lot of stuff behind closed doors that we don't know about. This they're not really letting us know that's about to go down. So I need everybody just to pay attention. I understand it's a bigger picture, man. If we don't stop doing what we're doing. It's about to get crazy out here, man. We're going to start losing a lot of people, man. A lot of people. But other than that, though, man, I'm just happy to be here, man. I appreciate you for having me on here, Star, and, and let me share my story with everybody, man. And and hopefully somebody can take something from this younger or um, younger generation or somebody that's playing right now. And, you know, and they can and, and learn from it and, and just, I don't know. I hope I just inspire people, man, from what, what I did, man, and try to make it better for other people, man. No doubt. Well, um, thank you again, man. And um, you know, God willing, I'll see you on the court again um soon. Cause I know you you definitely ha haven't uh, hung your hung your shoes up. I know you're still playing rec leagues and all that. So, God right. willing, I'll see you again soon, man. Appreciate it, man. Everybody on here, man. Thank y'all for being. I see a lot of my folks on here, man. DJ, I see Quam. I see you on here, Key. What's Shout up? Shout out my man Mike Morat. Just jumped on. I see on. Mike on here. Mike, what's up, man? So I, I appreciate everybody tuning in, man. I appreciate everybody, man. Let's just thank everybody. No doubt. God bless you, man. God bless your family, man. And um, just to let you know, just let everyone else know, like Mike Morak, everybody who just jumped on um, tomorrow, the entire interview is going to be on my YouTube channel. So, Flip, I'll text you the link so you can share it. And um, you know, it's going to be on YouTube forever. So the story is going to be out there forever. I appreciate it, Star. Thank you. My man, God bless you. Thank you as well. Thank you to you, bro. All right.
The standing room only crowd saw Norristown play a spectacular first half with number 46 foot two sophomore Lafton Thompson leading the way while his backcourt mate Jim Lever number 44 was finding the big